Our next speaker is Maureen Lichtfeld, and uh, Maureen's going to speak, uh, I think, primarily about her work in the Caribbean and uh, environmental stressors, disasters, infectious disease, implications for vulnerable communities. Thank you. Just when you thought you could leave, right? And so um, before you fall asleep, let's all get up. Let's just... <laughs> Circulate. Let that blood circulate a bit. Thank you. Um, most of the time, I have music with me, and we go into a Zumba dance, but um, <laughs> sorry, I don't have it. Um, so thank you. Um, what I'll do uh, this afternoon is um, tell you four stories. Uh, from a communication perspective, um, people remember best when you tell them a story. So here are stories from communities, from four communities. Um, all today, we talked about science, and my presentation is about how we make science work for communities. When I was at CDC, we called that taking the bench to the trench. And so, uh, ready? We're going on a journey. So today, I'd like to take you to four communities um, and during four environmental disruptions and the impact of those disruptions on those communities. So I'll take you back to 13 years ago um, at Hurricane Katrina. I'll take you to Nepal. Um, I'll take you to Puerto Rico. And then I'll take you to the country where I was born in Suriname. Um, I'll look at the consequences at the community level, and particularly the social capitals. Um, and then I'll talk about some opportunities um, for further research. And so it's not um, new that there are specific linkages between disasters and infectious disease, whether you have flooding or uh, migration or displacement, you see all the checkpoints. And so you can see them and read them faster than I can say them. Not new information. It's also not new when you take that information as an example and look at factor-borne disease that there are a number of determinants. So from the survival of the factor, the reproduction of the factor, um, the number of factor bites, and I'll come back to that, the bite rate, uh, the incubation of the pathogen. Uh, and so the, the burden of, 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 of uh, factor-borne diseases, as you see from WHO, is a sixth, and it disproportionately affects lower and middle-income countries. We know this paradigm. Uh, we've learned this in undergrad or high school even. But here's what's important. This is Aedes aegypti and, um, and, the, um, and the relationship. But what I'd like you to focus on are the competitors. If this works, if I can get there. The competitors, the density. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, yep. Bottom there, yeah. Yep. Not showing. But I'd like you to look at the, all the little um, squares outside of that basic triangle. Um, how age, ethnicity, gender, and immune status, and yes, that is the case with dengue. And I won't talk about that today because it, it doesn't relate to environmental disruption. But um, uh, genetic uh, disposition had a lot to do with dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, in the Caribbean, and not so much hygienic uh, circumstances. Um, increasingly, we see climate and the role of climate in the presence of Aedes aegypti uh, in the Caribbean. And as you just heard from Justin, urbanization. Critical is this. If you, if you remember nothing from this last presentation, it, please remember this, that what communities that are disproportionately affected face is a triple burden. That triple burden are first historic, historic presence of health disparities. Second, their residents, and more and more, their residents in disaster-prone areas. And thirdly, persistent environmental health threats. So this unique vulnerability, we put, on, we put enviro and infectious disease on top of that. So you create a quadruple um, challenge to, the, to, to human health. So case study one, Katrina, you remember 13 uh, years ago, um, I was one of the victims. I lost everything because I joined Tulane then three weeks before Katrina on August 1, 2005. 
Um, and so um, with me, so many um, are here still to tell, but others are not. There were fatalities, um, as you can see, uh, in each of the affected states. And it was uh, a very expensive hurricane for a number of reasons. Three fragilities. Fragile health, those historic health disparities. Uh, one of the highest uh, uninsured uh, con uh, states in the, in the United States. It's better now, but it was not then. A fragile health system. There was only one hospital. There was a trauma one hospital, and it took 10 years to get another trauma hospital back in place. And fragile governance, and whether you call it politics or policy, uh, we know that there was a lack of preparedness, and we know there, were a, there was a delay in the the. the aid that we needed when we needed it right after Katrina. I can talk to you uh, during dinner about that. And so what do we see in terms of uh, infectious disease? West Nile neuroinvasive disease. Um, the, if you look at the CDC weeks after, just before and just after Katrina, you see a clear jump um, from zero to about 11 um, cases. And the same is for Mississippi. So. Uh, in addition to the flooding and the mold and all that the communities had to deal with and the stresses, we, we also had um, West Nile, an, an uptick in West Nile. You see that again displayed here. So Katrina brought us three things. Well, it brought us some good things and it brought us some bad things, but it brought us three bad things. First was the wind. Second um, was the rain. And third was the flooding. So why do I make a distinction uh, among the three? I do because if you had flooding, you, were, um, you had a higher likelihood to get insurance um, to uh, refund you. If you had rain and wind and damage because of those two, that likelihood went down, which was my case. Um, and so you could see the consequences um, in terms of avian reservoir, you had either decreases or increases in avian reservoir, depending on what was going on. But you can see that both short term and long term, um, there were increases in, in factors, which of course relates directly to increases in factor borne diseases. Chagas, yes, we had a one case, a autochthonous case of Chagas. Um, uh, the, to date, back then, until then, there were five cases of Chagas, three in Texas, one in Tennessee, um, and one in California. So what happened after Katrina? Nine months after Katrina, we had increases in domestic uh, infestation of triatomes. Now, how is that possible? It is because we had an increase in armadillos. And so armadillos became this new host um, for, for all the, the past, including um, the triatome for the, the factor for trypanoma, trypanosoma cruci. But then after Katrina, nine months, the, the population of armadillos went down. And so they were looking for a new host. And that new host was the 74-year-old woman who had, when the health department visited, about 50 bites, insect bites. And so those was a case that we, we would, were able to confirm. No, no disaster preparedness took that, this, this into account. Case okay, study number two, we take you to Nepal. Um, the, um, a long, a decade-long uh, political uh, instability <clears throat> called, uh, titled Restless Peace. Um, the earthquake came, two, two earthquakes back to back, um, one in April and one in May. 7.8 and um, 7.3 on the Richter scale. Impact, 9,000 deaths, 22,000 injuries, 10% of the population uh, homeless, uh, health facilities were lost, and so significant damage. There was eight, but that eight was not coordinated. A fragile response resulted from that and a weak linkage between national and subnational, the same weak linkage we had after Katrina between national and state. But what do we find when there, with respect to infectious disease? Some, some mixed findings. Uh, acute gastroenteritis went up, uh, as you might expect, because of, of contaminated water. 
Um, but the linkage was stronger with pre-existing health disparities than it was with the contaminated water. We did not see what we expected. We did not see an increase in hepatitis E. So what does it mean? Um, it meant that the earthquakes, what, what those did specifically, um, is showed that fragile infrastructure, just like Katrina, where many villages were unable really to get help because they just were, were impassable roads. That there was variability, as I mentioned before, in the subnational response. Um, that there was tremendous reliance on international aid organizations, but that still today, not all homes are, are rebuilt and um, aid outside of the country can still not come in to provide piped drinking water. And so you could see, we could look at the infectious disease uh, in isolation and we won't get the, get the problem solved. Case study number three, Puerto Rico and uh, Hurricane Maria. Um, Hurricane Maria hit, of course, September 20, 20th, 2017, category four storm, um, tremendous amount uh, fast of wind, the power of wind, uh, 3.7 million inhabitants um, impacted. And yes, here I'm going to recognize my colleague Carlos uh, Santos Burgoa, who had the correct denominator for the number of fatalities and not the, not the denominator that was on social media. Um, estimated 90 billion um, damage in damage. Devastating impact, again, on infrastructure, uh, loss of food, for, uh, no food, no water, loss of electricity, and that is still going on in some of the areas in Puerto Rico, uh, lack of communication, and lack of medical care. Now, here's a response. This is, this is the timeline that it took um, working with the local authorities and CDC to reestablish and put in place the public health laboratories, critical to be functioning for, um, um, of course, analyzing infectious disease. And so we went all from September 20th all the way to January 27th. In that time frame, we can't legitimately say that there were no infectious disease. We just didn't have the capacity to measure. And so when that capacity was back online, what did we find? Um, increase in leptospirosis, um, 26 deaths as part of uh, what we saw. Now, you could say, uh, as good epidemiologists, was the increase because we looked harder or was the increase a true increase? Regardless what the reason was, we had 26 deaths. Lastly, I'll take you to the country where I come from, uh, Suriname. It is not in um, Asia, it is in South America. That's the country here. And I'll pay attention, pay attention to this eastern border because that's where, in 2006, the great floods, as the, as the community called it, happened. Uh, 50,000 people were displayed. 85% um, of them were descendants from uh, Maroons and uh, Amer Indians. A lot of damage, uh, primarily women and, and the elderly, were uh, disproportionately impacted. This is the story, though. You see a slight uptick in 2006 on diarrheal diseases, but then almost immediately going down, back down in 2007. So what's going on? Malaria. You see a definite a decrease in malaria cases in 2006, and then a further decrease, and then a little increase um, in um, around 2008, and I'll tell you why. The small increase in diarrheal diseases was countered by very effective existing 50-year-long surveillance. And so the public health infrastructure worked in this interior in the Amazon rainforest, it worked better than in some of our local health departments here. Now, why did we see a, um, a decrease in malaria? Well, the Anopheles darlingi, the factor uh, for uh, Plasmodium falciparum, the, paras the malaria parasite that's prevalent there, does not like turbulent water. They like clean water, and the, and the floods created, um, created uh, turbulent water. 
And so um, what the villages did is move their agricultural plots away from where the flooding was on higher grounds. But they did look for other sources of income. And so um, remember that, that border that I showed you. That other source of income is um, artisanal gold mining using mercury. Today, our, we have an environmental epidemiological study going on there of a thousand, a diet of a thousand pregnant women and their children. Uh, and today, the levels of mercury that we're finding in the pregnant mom are equivalent to those in the Seychelles. So what does this mean? What's the bottom line of all the work we did today and the stories I told you? Environmental disruption should and must include those slow uh, moving shocks and stressors, not only that acute event. That infectious disease post disruption is absolutely preventable when we make it an integral component of disaster preparedness response and recovery, not only in during response and recovery. Third, that coping strategies, where you think it's a good thing, actually cause now a natural bad thing. Um, we are currently measuring neurodevelopment in the babies uh, at 12 months as, you, as we speak. There's a team, one of my teams is in Suriname currently. Um, the triple fragility, health, health disparities, health infrastructure, and governance influence significantly the occurrence and, and the incidence of, um, and the prevalence of infectious disease. Maternal and childhood, particularly pregnant women and the zero to five year old, I propose should be considered as the sentinel health conditions when we're going to look at infectious disease exposure and infectious disease transmission and outcome. We talked about outcome earlier. Building capacity to collect data in those locally trained community health workers, people who are there every day, other than waiting for one of us or some of us to, to appear, because losing the, the period where nothing is going on, where no acute thing is going on, that inter-disaster period, not collecting data and not having baseline is a poor excuse for any study afterwards that says we can't compare because baseline is not available. It's actually almost unethical. And so uh, we know the limitations of a cross-sectional approach. And so let's invest in longitudinal data collection, not surveillance data only, but really observational and in very in-depth baseline assessment. And so if you think about the work that we're doing today and the, and, and the science that we'll discuss tomorrow, think about these people, because that's what our work uh, should be about, and that's what we, we, where we should work for. So thank you.